Good evening, everybody. I'm Kathy Vaness from The Golden Door, and I'm so proud to be sitting here tonight with Chef Greg Fry Jr., who is our executive chef and our creative, I think, genius behind our culinary program. But what we're going to talk to you tonight about is he is our beekeeper. And we have bees all over the property. And we're going to learn a little bit about these secret insects that many of us are scared of, mm -hmm. but you so shouldn't be because they're not interested in us at all. They're interested in flowers and fruits and pollination, and, and we're, we're not pollinating type things. So that's what we're going to learn tonight. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. So I'm going to just open up with some interesting statistics, as I know you have so much to say. I have plenty more. I know. I'm not even worried. I'm not even worried. A honey, a honey bee's wings, the stroke is incredibly fast, about 200 beats per second, which makes their famous distinctive buzz. If we didn't know, that's what it is. It's those wings. A honeybee can fly for up to six miles and as fast as 15 miles an hour, those little things. And I think one of the questions we ask as a beekeeper, have you ever been stung? Yes, a few times. A few times. And I think my, my uh, record for one visit is uh, 44. So in one visit? In one visit, yeah. But you go through this in That was when I was starting. So, that's so you're getting better. <laughs> but they don't seem to be afraid of you. No, I mean, it, you know what? Uh, the, what when a, one thing that the bees actually, the bees communicate a lot on vibration, sounds, and smell. And a lot of those you and I don't pick up very well. And when you go to the hive, if you're nervous and you're sitting next to the hive and you're nervous or apprehensive, the bees pick up on that. They can smell the pheromones, they can smell a lot of that, uh, those defensive things that we give off and they get uncomfortable. And when they're uncomfortable, you know, you end so up they know more. you. They, do you think they actually uh, no, sort of say, oh, this is Chef Greg coming over to take care of us? I don't think they know me at all. Um, I, I actually know them. I learn more about them, and I learn how to approach each hive differently. Over the time of working with them, um, and uh, you know, the really interesting thing of the genetics of it, the queen always gives off a very similar offspring. So, you know, even when I know a queen from a, you know, let's say a queen is a um, descendant of another queen, I know that hive should be approached this way. So each hive is different. So I, I don't even have to have these questions down. You're approaching a territory that our guests are going to want to know what is the real story of what goes on in these hives. Like, talk about the queen, talk about the guards, talk about the life of a bee so for I think, a second. You know, we don't take, well, we take for granted exactly how complicated uh, their communication really is and how complicated their society is. Their society is, is, we consider them to be a super organism. So they're on the same level as ants. Okay, now in a hive, a beehive, and we're specifically talking about Apis mellifera right now, this, the, the honeybee. Um, in the honeybee's hive, you have one queen. There can only be one queen. No matter how many boxes there no are. No matter how many boxes, each box is going to have to have its own individual queen, but each box can't have two queens in it. Only one queen is allowed to lay eggs in each box. And each queen will have to lay in like season, like right now where we're at, as we're heading into the season, each queen is laying upwards of 2,000 eggs a day. That's her body weight in eggs a day, constantly. They don't sleep. I mean every day? Every day. And For this how long? Is to, how many days? I mean, she's going to do this all the way through until about fall. Every single and day. And that's when she'll start to slow down. And she, now she is obviously busy laying eggs, so she will not be able to feed herself. She relies on an entourage of other bees that work with her, nurse bees that clean her, feed her. There's guard bees that make sure that any bee that's getting next to the queen has business with the queen. Or there's also guards that sit down this in the front amazing. of the hive and make sure that anyone coming in and out of the hive so wait, is supposed that, to be in there. Most people really don't know there's a little like door. So if you had, you know, most of us have seen like the modern day hive as a box and the box was made by uh, Langstroth, which was a, a French um, immigrant here to the United States. He made this box so it was easy for us to use, pull the, sh pull the frames in and out. At the very bottom of the box is a slit that can range anywhere from 12 inches to just a few centimeters. And the reason they, we, I closed that slot up in the winter time to give the bees when they are at their lowest number less space to guard because other bees will come by and pick on a, a, a less uh, or a, uh, so a weaker hive. So follow that. So if I was a not on our hives or is it from one box to the other, I'm a neighbor bee coming from somebody else and you have a lot of honey in your hive and I, I want to take it. I want to take it to my if hive. I'm strong enough. So now I'm going to fly into this little hole. I'll give you a better what's idea. What's going to happen? 
here's an even more interesting thing. Besides the honey, let's take the West uh, Africanized bees. Yeah, so here we are in San Diego. We are Africanized bees came up from South America. What Africanized bees do is they take over our hives. So we have to be very vigilant over them. What happens is the queen and a bunch of her guards land on the side of the box. The swarm may hang out close by. Now, every, every so often, the guards of this queen, this Africanized queen, will walk her into this hive that's already occupied by, uh, by bees. They'll walk her in, and they will just start to get the rest of the bees accustomed to her scent because the queen's scent is what rules everything. That's how they know this is their hive. That's how they know they feel comfortable. This is a stranger queen. This is a strange Africanized queen. When they start to, real, they start to feel that the bees are comfortable with this new queen coming in, then they, the guards will take this new queen up all the way to the existing queen, and the queen will have to dispatch the existing queen, and then the, they will call the rest of their friends and they will take over the hive. Amazing. Who knew? Isn't that incredible? So let's go back to your story because I love all this. Got You've it. got these yeah. little guards downstairs. That, yeah. mm -hmm. So who's doing all the work? Who's the fetching and who's the workers? The females are doing all the work. And what are the males 99 doing? 99% of the hive's population <laughs> is female. 99? 99% is female. It's Where are the female. males? The males are called drones. They're only existing now, which is spring, upwards of, to fall. By fall time, they kick them out. The and male's job go? is only to mate. Okay. They, will, they will actually chew the wings off or the legs off if they don't get the idea in the fall time because the males don't, the, all they do is breed. The males don't cook, they don't clean, they don't get any of the wax, they don't collect any of the nectar. They're not cleaning the queen. They don't do any of this they stuff. Do they don't even feed themselves. They actually rely on handouts given to them by the other worker bees in order to survive. The, the male's job is to leave every afternoon, go find the designated mating spot, hang out there for a virgin queen to come flying by. Well, that must be rare. With How her. often could that be? Well, because they only die. They, well, they die after they've made it. So it's not that great. So they're yeah. waiting on some tree for some nice, cute little bee to come by. Right. So but when it can't a, just be any queen. She's got to have a hive. When a queen first emerges, she's a virgin. She will only make this one trip outside of the hive to mate. She will mate with anywhere from... 12, 15 drones, let's say, whatever it takes to fill up her ovary ducts, and that will be all of the sperm she will use for the rest of her entire lifetime. Amazing. She will hold that sperm in suspended animation, animation excuse me, for the next, could be two years, could be seven years. We have documented cases of queens living so upwards of seven years. So what happens if the queen dies? So the queen can be replaced by any other female. The difference between the queen and the rest of the females in the caste system, you have your queen, a male and a female, or a worker bee. The difference between the female and the queen is that the queen has developed reproductive systems. The female bee can lay an egg, but she doesn't have a reproductive system where she can mate and fertilize that egg. So the, any egg that's been laid and been fertilized that will become a female, the bees can now take that egg, feed it a special diet, and that will become a queen. And so they usually make six or seven, maybe 10 queens. The first one to emerge, her job, her first job is to find the other queen cells and dispatch those queens. And if it happens to be that they've two queens emerge at the same time, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat out in the, on oh the on honeycomb. <laughs> Fascinating. You know, it's believed that honey history dates back as far as 10 to 20 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And the practice of beekeeping to produce honey dates it to back before 700 BC. So I want to hear a little bit about the process of making the honey, because this is yeah. what we love, is this fresh, unaltered, non-processed honey. Well, you know, honey is a byproduct, really. Honey is a byproduct of the job of the bees. The job of the bees is to pollinate. 80% of the fruits and vegetables that you and I eat come from pollinated flowers that are, you know, the pollination is you know, done by an insect. And much of that is by honeybees. Now when they're doing the pollination, they are actually more interested, they're going to collect nectar so that they, and, and pollen, and they're taking that back to the hive and the nectar will become their food store for the winter time when there is no flowers. Now when they come back, nectar is, uh, when they first get it, about anywhere from 65 to 45 percent water. The rest of it is the sugars and the other enzymes. The bees now will, this forager bee, 
She's got two stomachs. Let, I mean, let's start with that. She's got two stomachs. One stomach's for eating. The second stomach is specially designed for her to just hold nectar. So it's this, essentially a, you know, a pouch inside her that she will fill up with the nectar. She will fly back to her hive after visiting 50 to 100 flowers. When she gets back to the hive, she gets greeted at the front entrance by the guards. She gets clearance to pass. She goes through, meets another bee. Her job is to take that nectar from her take it upstairs into the hive to wherever they're holding the, the nectar, put it in the proper cell, and then there's other bees. Their job is to sit there and chew on the nectar, essentially. They release an enzyme from a special gland in their head that actually breaks down some of these sugars, and that, combined with this constant chewing and fanning in the heat of the hive, the evaporation, will turn that into honey. And don't they know, I remember you telling me this, the difference between a citrus, you know, an orange flower. Oh yeah, yes. And they put it back in the exact same spot. And this is what makes honey bees so um, exceptional at pollination, or why we have used them so much for pollination, is because the honey bee is very A-type. Whereas many other bees may go from this flower to this flower. So let's say this bee went from rosemary to lavender to basil to strawberry. Honey bees, when they go out for a trip, if they land on, on rosemary, or they went out with the intention of landing on rosemary, they go rosemary, 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 back to the hive. That nectar goes into the cell that holds rosemary yes. nectar. Same with the pollen. If they found squash, they would only go squash, squash, squash. So that's why we have used them so much for pollination because they have a very lower chance of And at of the end of the day, is that the difference in the taste? Can you actually taste the, the, the taste, difference? You know what, the taste of honey is a, it's a mix, um, you know, it's, it is the best mixture you could ever have of what the season is. It's all these different flowers, because I can't extract just one cell. When I go to extract, I have to extract the whole frame, all the cells. So you're getting this bouquet of what was actually growing. So now when you, you say be, extract, wait a second, yeah. I want you to take that thought. Okay. You've got these things, these, uh -huh. what do you call, shelves. Yeah. So then what happens? So the frame, so what I do, like when I go to collect honey, you put a box, uh, you take the box that you want to collect and you have to scare the bees off this box because obviously they're not really interested in giving up all their hard earned work. So there's a couple methods that we have and the method that I use that it feels the most in, uh, uninvasive is we take a board, um, it's lined with diapers and I spray on it this little enzyme. It basically is the same smell as rotten cherries. It doesn't smell that bad really honestly. Um, some, someone's bad cooking, I guess, but, um, the, but however, the bees cannot stand the smell and they go running away. And I put another board in between that's kind of like a maze. So they go through this hole and out this maze and they can't come back into the honey. So when I come back to it two minutes later, there's no bees left in there and I can pick up this box and put two tops on it and walk away. Now when I get back to where I'm going to extract it, I'm going to take these frames out. I have to cut the wax capping off it. So if you've seen honey in a comb, you'll see like this white papery scaly looking covering. Well, that's just wax capping so that the honey just doesn't start falling out. Um, now, after I've cut that off, you put it into this big drum that's a centrifuge. And it just spins really fast, slings all the honey out to the side. From, that, from there, it goes into a holding tank. And then all I do is strain it and put it into the jar. And it goes right in the jar. That's, that's an amazing part. No processing. That's, right that's into it. the jar and right onto our toast. <laughs> so I want to go back to talk about these incredible bees. Do they know when you have, we have what now? 10 hives, 12 well, hives, 50, we have a few hives. We're coming out of winter time and we, we're coming out of winter with three very good healthy hives. Do they know their hives? Yes, individually they, they, they know their hive very much. If I take their hive entrance and I move it over three inches, they'll be lost for about an hour. If I took their hive and I turned it around 45 degrees, I stand to lose a lot of bees because they'll, they'll die because of struggling to try to find. They know, they actually see very differently than you and I. The, the bees actually have five eyes. They have two of those big eyes that we see, those almond shaped, those pretty almond shaped eyes on their side. And then they have three more eyes on the top of their head. But they see light differently than you and I do. And they can actually direct themselves based upon this light and they know exactly where that hole is. They know exactly where to go and you change that a little bit and it throws them way off. They know exactly where they're going. 
the temperament of bees, you, you're out with those hives all the time. You're rescuing hives, you know, we're obviously making a lot of honey. Yes. Do the, do the bees have different temperaments? Can yes. you tell, like in the same hive, is there like angry bees and happy bees and, you know, each, meditating bees? Each one is very different. Can I have you, a hive out there you're right You're now. looking at them right now. Do you, can you actually see the difference in the bees? You feel the themselves? difference, actually. I mean, you can, you can even hear it. You can, you can sense it, you can hear it. Um, and the one hive that doesn't sting you very often is obviously the very good hive. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that they're very good for, they're, they're easy to work with. Out of the three hives that are up there right now, the one hive is very calm, very good natured. I can open up that top. I'm not going to have, without the smoke, I'm not going to have visitors unless I really provoke them. I have another hive that if I'm just standing next to their hive, I'm going to get provoked. If I open up the lid, I got people flying, you know, bees flying right out at you immediately. Uh, even when I'm using the smoke, they're a little tough. Now, the other hive that's really calm and nice and gentle, if I use any smoke, it makes them angry. Now, if I use the, uh, the other hive, if I don't use any smoke, I'm in for a really hurting day. <laughs> so each hive, but you, but this, you have to, you know, it's just like, you a, know your a, like another animal. So you, how, how, you there's do. how many bees in a hive? And typically, in the season, you can have anywhere from about 40,000 to 80,000 in a good hive. Um, and like right now, our hives are just gearing up and there's about 20 to 25,000 in each hive right now. So if you think about how much honey we've mm -hmm. had to make in like what? A few months, really, yes. right? Yes, I mean, well, How many bees did it take to make that honey? Give me a second to calculate, I know, my yeah. goodness. Well, let's, let's, how many let's do the short math real quick yeah. here. So we shipped, um, so far, Today, we've shipped about 6,000 pounds of honey. It will take two, nearly two million flowers to make each pound of honey. This is how important flowers are. All right, I've got, anything. I got a little jar here for a little demo. Seems like a good spot. Everybody see that? Not a lot of honey in there, is there? This amount of honey could fuel one bee her whole, a whole entire trip around the United States, or the world. This little tiny bit of honey would fuel. So if I put you next to a room, and the, the room, you, like if you filled your room up with food, that would be enough for you to get all the way around the world. Pretty interesting, but they are so much more efficient. That pound, you know, um, what I, the, the next one I love is the MPG. So bees get seven million miles to the gallon of honey, <laughs> on honey, obviously. Obviously, they don't fly that far, but you know, they're very efficient creatures. But you know, I've learned so much since we started doing honey, mm -hmm. and I've gained such respect for these, these, these insects, I guess. I mean, that's the only word to call them, these bees. They're animals. Why so are know. people, people are so afraid of them. They won't go near them, they, but they really are not interested. What do we do to help people understand that, imagine our planet without bees. Mm. It would be a real challenge. I think people, I, you know, honestly, What's I really do. What's the you would give them to not be so afraid? I think people, well, most everyone, we have a, well, it's a natural thing. We're naturally afraid of bees. You know what the bees' best defensive weapon is? It's not their stinger. It's our fear. Yeah. It's their ability to make us fear them is their best weapon that we stay away from them. Truthfully, bees are very passive. The bees are very, very They're passive. They're not interested in us at all. They are not. You, no. when, you know, when you get visitors, it's probably more because you smell more like the flowers from your perfume or the cosmetics that you may be using. Or you're eating, you know, something sugary and out, outside and the bees say, oh, good sugar, I like it. Um, or you may be in the pool and it's hot and they need water to cool down their hive. Um, when we end up getting stung, it's because our lives have crossed their lives path and we end up looking as though we are a threat. That is it. I can go and sit next to my hives and even though I've got a pesky hive up there, I can sit next to there for a long time. One of my hives, I could sit up there all day long and no one's gonna bother me at all. It's, they're a lot more passive than you and I give them credit for. And they're not like just see, ooh, person, come dig Well, and they're intelligent. The you had one set up a water fountain for the bees right next to the bees so they could get their water. You know exactly <laughs> yeah. where I'm going to yeah. go. And the bees decided that they they it's didn't not like this water fountain. <laughs> it was perfectly fine and fresh. So they decided to fly out here, you know, in the little water fountain that's right here. Uh -huh. And if you're in the summertime and you can just pause for a minute and watch, there are always bees flying in and out of that water. So why yeah. 
Do, was there, is there actually a difference? Why did they decide? Yeah, they they, they, they just decided that water wasn't what they wanted. It's taste. I mean, they have good taste. What are you going to say? Fla but then they're, the they're also pollinating the flowers we like, so yeah, they have good taste. <laughs> Research indicates that populations will decline is going to have a, ver a, a huge effect on our economy. Between environment, agriculture, pesticides, things that we're doing to bees, actually killing them because they're maybe in the wrong spot to even make a hive. We're going to talk about your rescuing. You know, this is a very serious threat. Mm -hmm. It's not just honeybees. What are things that we as just regular people could do to help Let's not make this go happen? Go right back to one of that first thing, you know, 80% of those fruits and vegetables, you know, more than one third of the average American diet comes from bees. $20 billion is their estimated contribution to our United States agriculture. $20 billion. We can't That's live without the bees. No. Uh, you, you know, every almond that you've had while you've been staying here with us, every one of those came from a bee. Um, so without them, you can't have the fruits and vegetables, the healthy diet that you and I need to. Now, um, what you and I can do, we could plant flowers. Um, very, very much Real so. Flowers. When you know wildflowers that are going to feed the bees, they're going to provide them with some food because that is one of the things. As you and I put down a lawn, as we landscape, if we're not putting out flowers that are actually going to um, feed these honeybees as well as the natural pollinators that are out there. But aren't there also different kinds of flowers? Oh, absolutely. The I mean, ones that they just that are sort of the fake flowers. You have flowers that they don't need, feed the bees, right. and then you have flowers you that have are know. feeding bees. You know, yeah, you so know. there's plenty of good databases online yeah, nowadays yeah. with all the in, you know all the information that's out there. But the planting the flowers, like I said, if we if you think about how many flowers it takes to make honey, two million flowers to make one pound of honey. Well, a hive can make it needs to make almost hundred pounds of honey for itself. So that's almost two hundred million flowers. You and I are our best. We're not going to plant that many flowers. So I have really, I think the best thing that you and I can do is help other people be aware of exactly how intricate they are and then take a moment to think about what is around your house that is either benefiting them or not benefiting them. Maybe you're spraying different things around your house uh, that your pesticide management company could be spraying for you. They may not even know. Believe me, I've had pesticide management companies come in and have no idea what they were spraying, what it actually killed. And they didn't realize that not only did it target ro roaches and ants and spiders, but it also targets all these other beneficial animals and insects that we need. So it, taking a moment to kind of educate yourself and find out, you know, there's, I'm not going to say there's no place for that, but, you know. But we, we've learned since we've been it. there, even in New York City, on top of the buildings in New York yeah. City, there are, there's, everybody's talking about well, They all fly to New Jersey, though. Where are they getting their, <laughs> where, there's no flowers up there. Where are they getting their, they're st flying to the Hudson? Yeah, they all do. There's a lot of them that there's cross over the Hudson. There's a lot of beekeeping going on top there of There is. That. And there's actually, Brooklyn is one of the biggest. Right. And, um, you know, there's a lot of good Did you all know on that on top of buildings island. in New York City, they are beekeeping? Isn't so, that cool? New York City, so great. Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles just last year. Um, even our San Diego, we modified our rules uh, just two years ago so that we could have better hobbyist beekeeping practices. A lot of the beekeeping rules and ordinances were made back in the 70s and early, you know, early 80s or 60s, and they were made for commercial people. Well, they were really not at all in, ta in tune with what we need. Like, we don't need one beekeeper with thousands of hives. We need thousands of people right. with hives. But is it hard to be a hobbyist? I've heard so many people who want to do it. Is it a hard process to be a beekeeper? It is not a hard process to be a beekeeper in the actual work of it. It is hard to be a beekeeper and deal with the um, negative effects of being a beekeeper. You have to get used to seeing your bees die. It was the hardest thing for me to, I'm still not over it really, I mean when I lose a hive it's like losing another pet. I, for my first two years as a beekeeper I f was frantic over any bee dying. I mean, if I was working with the bees and the bees stung me, I was just, I would get, oh, it's so nervous. And I can't do anything about that. Um, you know, and that is really the hardest thing is, you know, you put a lot of work in, you put a lot of care. You, like I said, they have their own temperament. So you start to just, you know how to treat them. You, you, they become just another extension of you. To listen to me, I know something. To listen to my mentors who run 15 to 50,000 hives and have been doing it for 40 years, it's completely different. They speak bee. I know about bees. They speak bee. But you're now getting the phone calls 
I do, you know. We've actually filmed Greg in a rescue. Mm -hmm. All it's of our hives right now are all rescues. All rescue, and, tell, and you, you go to these people's houses and it's in the hose? Or Even the, the day before your daughter's wedding, I saved a hive. I know. <laughs> tell them about that, yeah. because it's really an interesting process, because someone really did take the time to make the phone call, because they had made it a home, mm -hmm. they had to go somewhere, and instead of poisoning them and, and spraying them, which you don't want to do, you actually call a beekeeper and tell them about how well, you, I say, you tell know, them about those the row this, what we have on film we have it slow motion I'm, you t the queen oh my gosh so when you it's amazing you it's can amazing. purchase bees as a beekeeper but i really encourage people to you, there's plenty of bees out there that need to be rescued and put into a better place and so um, i i and many of us as beekeepers are all on this list. Essentially, it's a call list, and you know, someone can go down this list and start calling numbers. And there's some people like myself that will do it for free, and there's others that do it as a business. Um, sometimes the bees build themselves into a wall or something like that. I'm not a contractor; I can't do that. I will happily come and collect them if a contractor opens up the wall. But um, what I've done, like what I did with this one hive, this was. Um, they had built themselves a nice little nest uh, or hive in a irrigation box that was on the, in the ground and was right off, uh, right on the other side of a wall for a large community. Now, the whole backside was just a beautiful hillside just right out there to the freeway. They had all these flowers to themselves. For four years, they lived in this irrigation box. For four years, happy, good. The man who lived there sees a couple guys from the HOA out there looking at this. And he rushed out and said, what are you, what are you guys doing? And I said, well, we're going to have to change the control valve that's in here. And I said, well, can you, can you give me a, t a week and I'll find someone to come and collect these bees. And that's where I get to come in. And I come in, we collect the bees very carefully out of there. We take our time. We find the queen. Because the queen, if I get the queen, they'll go with me wherever I go. They're in single file. I have it on a piece of sheet. I have it filmed in single file. So what, yeah. Marching after the queen, thousands of bees on this white sheet going into the box. Fascinating. So Absolutely incredible. I actually have a little tea infuser. You know, those little things of tea. And I put her in the tea infuser and I hang this chain inside the box. And so the smell of her pheromones, they will follow that smell of her pheromones. So it takes a minute for them to find it, but the minute they find it, it they are rushing. Rushing. And the, you can see on the video where they're climbing over each site. other to get into the new box. And once they're all happy in that new box, I let go of that queen. And, and that actually is the, that is my more pesky hive in here. <laughs> but when they're pesky, they are, when they're more aggressive, they're actually more aggressive at their nectar collecting. They're also more aggressive at building more comb. So not always is the calm, cool, yeah, whatever bee is, uh, not always really the best worker, uh, you know, but you never know, it can be different. Well, do you feel, you know, the Zika virus came in Florida and they ended up spraying for the virus but forgot to tell the beekeepers to collect their bees so they lost half their bee population in Florida? It is and do you think the government, though, but that's really a communication issue, in my opinion. People should have really thought about that and communicated, because these bees are so important. Do you think we're getting enough support to save these bees? It's a very political You know, in Japan, right they now. tried to make the <laughs> fake bees, and that, obviously that experiment completely failed. No one could actually do the work of a bee, yeah. even if they faked it. Yeah. A human was trying to act like a bee, and it didn't no, work. No, we do that now in China. There's places in China where they have, they're, yeah. they're so chemical laden that they, they, they cannot keep successful cannot hives. It. So they, they actually pollinate, hand pollinate the cherries and apples and things. But do we, um, have, do we right. have enough support? I mean, I mean that just sounds like we were, communication. Let, let me put it this way. I mean, right now, I'm very unsure. I, I, I'd like to think of myself as the optimist um, or, or like to be optimistic and think that you know, we have been heading in the right direction. Um, for many years, we have been heading in the right direction, although the EPA for the last three administrations have not, and I'm not considering the new administration, we have not had good support from the EPA yet. Um, all of the hard work that has been done has been done from a grassroots level of people, farmers, beekeepers, um, just activists who are interested and understand the importance of it. The EPA has not always looked at the best interest. Now, where we are now, today, it's anyone's call at this point. Um, there's a lot to be done. There's a lot of, we just, you know, the um, Wildlife and Fisheries Agency just passed uh, in September a um, 
they put on seven different bees on the endangered species list. This is a first. This is a first of them ever putting a bee on the endangered species list, or several types of them. Now, none of those are honeybees. Um, these are specific individual bees. In the United States, we have over 2,700 native bees. None of those are honeybees. All the honeybees here in the United States all were imported at one time or another. All of them came from either Europe or we've brought them in some other way, whether it's Africanized bees. The rest of those are like the carpenter bees, the bumble, the, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of species of bumblebees. There's thousands of solitary bees like sweet bees and masonry bees and carpenter bees and then there's another several hundred of these little infinitesimal small, small, small bees that look like flies. And I'm hoping, like we've seen a few out here in our garden, we have a really good area for a lot of these native pollinators. And they're actually better at pollinating certain things than our honeybees are. So take for instance like a watermelon. A watermelon flower that has a male and a female flower, so it's not self-pollinating. You can't just throw up, grow it and hopefully it happens. That female flower will only open up for five to seven hours on a given day, one day only in its life, and has to be deposited with 500 to 1,000 pollen grains. That's going to take a honeybee at least 20, you know, at least 20 visits of a different honeybee. Several native pollinators can do that in five or seven trips. A human has to sit there and, I mean, imagine going and trying to pollinate. So native pollinators actually make those big, those big bulky watermelons that we always like to see and go into our summer. That comes from bumblebees. So next time we buy those watermelons in summer, we're going to think quite differently about those watermelons. Yeah. You know, we have this honey. I'm going to give you just a few more questions. And it's dark now. Mm -hmm. But I think when we talked, why does it stay dark in the fall and light? What is it that's making it a darker color? Is it always going to be dark? No, it's always depending upon the flower, that, the predominant flower that the nectar was collected from. So in the springtime here for our area, in the springtime, a lot of the flowers that are in bloom, and it's not just the gardens, mind you, you know, we're talking millions and millions of flowers. So the bees will find wherever, and we have our chaparral out here. A lot of that honey comes in, or that nectar ends up becoming, uh, when they turn it honey, very, very light, almost clear and see-through. Yeah. Um, now, as we progress through the year, it's not the color of the honey that's changing as we progress through the year. And the taste the year, isn't really changing. And it's completely different. No, At the end of the good. year, we have more of the trees that are actually blossoming. And it's the trees that give the darker colors, some of the, like the acacias and things like that. Um, so it's, it's all, the color is all dependent upon the predominant flower within the honey. Or like what we're selling is wildflower honey. It's just mixed of whatever. I, there is no like one flower. When, we name honey, we name honey not because we knew the bees all went to this flower, but when we taste it, oh, those are orange blossoms, or that's an avocado honey, or that's a eucalyptus honey. There's, um, there's, that's the only thing that USDA mandates on testing the honey is that the flavor has to be the predominant flavor of whatever you're calling it. So if you call it avocado, you have to taste avocado. <laughs> so at the end of every one of our speaker series, we always ask our guest, which is you tonight, Chef. Greg Fry Jr. for a golden nugget for our guests. So what would be your golden nugget for our guests tonight? I think the, the biggest thing that I try to convey when I either do a bee talk or the bee walk or, you know, the next time you see a bee, I promise you, you're going to be a lot more cognizant of where they are. You're going to be more conscious of where they are. When you see them working, don't run away. Let them go all about their business and do their thing. If you see a hive moving into your house, go to the website, find someone that will, you go, bee savers, promise you, you'll get a whole bunch of hits. Anything that we can do to increase the population of uh, not only honeybees, but native bees, it only is returning favors on us because they're returning, they have been doing so much for you and I for thousands of years. Anything that we could do for them, it's, it's, it's the most important.